properly. We have been saying that we are bringing you updates of all of the discussions that have been taking place on the IPU platforms. And this afternoon, I do have with me um, that day, uh, uh, Shivambu, who is also a member of the delegation. Yesterday, he attended um, the governing council as well as the Young Parliamentarians Forum. He's joining us to talk to us a little bit more about what was discussed on those two platforms. Honorable Shivambu, thank you very much for making the time and welcome to the platform. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Wonderful. Just by way of um, introducing our conversation or opening up our discussion, talk to us firstly about um, the two main agenda items that were discussed at the Young Parliamentarians Forum that you attended yesterday. No, I actually did not participate in the Young Parliamentary Forum. I participated in the governing council of uh, the 145th Assembly of the IPU. So it's throughout it's... my participation, that is what the, the discussion, and the major discussion, one was the debate on the theme of this assembly, which is on gender parity and, and, and gender representation in parliaments and presence of females in different uh, parliaments. But then the major other discussion was in relation to an emergency item. So there were different emergency items that were introduced by different countries. So it is standard in all IPU assemblies that there must be one emergency item that gets to be discussed. And that must relate to one of the recent global events and developments. There was yes. a proposal by Pakistan as to discussing the uh, the recent floods that have occurred in uh, Pakistan in terms of uh, what what happens then then there was a proposal from Iraq in relation to what they say is the invasion of their sovereignty and interferences in their own country by mostly yeah. the United States and Turkey and then there was a proposal that came from Chile and co-sponsored by the group of Latin American and Caribbean countries, but also by Ukraine in relation to what they say is the expansion of Russia to uh, Ukrainian territory. So mm. that was the discussion in terms of uh, what has uh, got to happen. And our view as South Africa was that because the 144th assembly of the IPU that took place in March 2022 discussed the issue of Russia and Ukraine, but also also took a resolution to put up a task force that had to intervene, uh, particularly in, in discussions with parliaments of both countries. We, we then said that there was no need to traverse the same territory and discussion mm -hmm. which already had occurred in the 144th Assembly that we can't all the time when we meet as the IPU always discuss the Russia, Ukraine situation, even when we've got mechanism and system that have been put in place to respond to the conflict, to also have practical interventions with the peoples of seeking peace. Because there are so many other global issues that are of interest, uh, that includes the issue which was brought to our attention by Pakistan, there's an issue of food security that must be discussed. There are the issues that are of global significance that needed the attention of the IPU, but they seem to be obsession, particularly from the 12 plus group, which is mostly the European countries to almost always want to discuss the Russia-Ukraine situation. And in most instances, that discussion happens on a one-sided way of condemnation of Russia and and, and trying to bedevil anyone else who has got a different perspective. So that is what basically got to transpire yesterday in terms of the deliberations. And then, then today the, there was an agreement in principle that we should uh, proceed uh, to dis discuss that and the resolution was passed. And then we are going to then go to a drafting committee. So we have been assigned by the Africa group to join the drafting team to draft the resolution. So it's 11 of us who are going to be drafting the resolution of the IPU in terms of what then becomes a nuanced and better approach uh, mm -hmm. of the IPU in response to the 
Ukraine and vice versa situation. Indeed. Um, that was a comprehensive uh, overview, Honorable Chivambu. Talk to us about um, the proposal that uh, South Africa actually fielded um, at the SADC region uh, meeting, where, of course, there was a view that uh, the region, and of course, Africa as well, should also be proposing an emergency item. And um, there was a lot of discussion that went on around that, but speak to us about um, South Africa's proposal and the importance of that proposal. No, look, part of the considerations that were made as the South African delegation was to introduce an emergency item for discussion on the reform of the United Nations, particularly the United Nations Security Council, yes. to say that we need a much more representative United Nations because as things stand, a majority of the major regions in the world, in South America, and the entire African continent do not have permanent representation in the United Nations, but also pointing to the fact that when the United Nations was founded uh, 77 years ago in 1945, there was only three African countries that had some sovereignty and could be permitted to participate in the United Nations. Now we've got 54 countries in the African continent mm -hmm. with a population of more than 1.3 billion people but we do not have a structured voice in the United Nations, which is supposed to be a global multilateral institution uh, that must also build peace and maintain peace in all parts of the world. So we were then proposing a motion that said that we need to get the IPU to have a debate on the reform of the United Nations and the yes. UN Security Council so that we can have a clear framework and resolution in terms of what happened. And of course, when we introduced that to the SADAT group, it was not accepted on the basis that it is not a recent issue. So we are now still exploring the mechanism as to how do we get to schedule the discussion on the United Nations reform on the main agenda of the IPU. I would think that before the end of the 145th assembly of the IPU, we would have found the expression that when we go to the 146th assembly of the IPU in Manama and Bahrain uh, in, in March of 2023, the issue of the UN reform must be part of the main agenda items that must be del deliberated upon because this structural, systematic, and systemic exclusion of the African continent from major multilateral bodies, particularly the, Union, the United Nations, is irrational. It's not sensible. It doesn't. It's senseless. So we have to change that. And the IPU is a correct instrument to could play that role because it is basically the oldest. The IPU is the oldest multilateral organization at 133 years. And it seems to be having meaningful participation from a lot of countries. I mean, here in, uh, in Rwanda and Kigali, there's 143 countries that are in attendance. That shows that uh, a lot of countries are taking these institutions seriously. So if all of us here agree that we must reform the United Nations, we can constitute the more than two thirds that is required to amend the United Nations Charter, to reconstruct the architecture of the United Nations. And it's one of the debates which, as South Africa, the SADAC region, as the African continent, we must champion. And these huge prospects of it gaining success if we were to handle it in a much more cogent and consistent and properly planned way. Okay, now when we look at, uh, reflect on the importance of this uh, proposal that was fielded by South Africa, um, and if there is consensus within the IPU from all of the member uh, parliaments that are part of the IPU, what mechanisms are in place to actually um, engage the United Nations and to ensure that if such a resolution is actually taken by, adopted by the, by the IPU, that it will be well received that indeed this resolution or that this commitment to reform um, the Security Council, that it actually finds expression that it is implemented accordingly. I think a much, a much more appropriate mechanism and approach to the IPU's uh, discussion around the United Nations reform 
would be one to schedule a discussion in an assembly or even theme an assembly around the reform of the United Nations. And once we take a resolution of what we think as parliament of the world, what we think should be a reform content and character of a reform United Nations, we then go to further talk to regional parliaments and continental parliaments, like the Pan-African Parliament, the European Commission and European Parliament, and all other representative bodies of elected people all over the world. And I don't, I'm, 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 I've got no doubt that if, if that process uh, takes that route, we can be able to mobilize and get consensus from almost all parliaments in the world. And after that, we then go to the United Nations and then table collectively a motion that is going to amend the United Nations Charter and then, and then say that the Security Council must be reconstituted in a manner that is geographically representative because currently it is countries in Europe and China and Russia that are represented in the United Nations. And not because they were elected, it's because they coincidentally played a major role in the formation of the United Nations. But the global balance of forces and dynamics have changed significantly now. Sure. There has to be a legitimate multilateral body that is representative of all the people that must drive peace, build peace and make sure that there is a development in all parts of the world. So, 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 so there is a, a, a sensible and reasonable space of progress if we were to be consistent in the manner in which we can reform the United Nations. And, and then, and then if we, we get it right here in Kigali, most definitely when we go to Manama in Bahrain in March, 2023, there will be some sense of direction as to what exactly we seek to achieve. Indeed, when we look at the dynamics of uh, the discussion around the issue of uh, the Russia-Ukraine issue, um, we can see that uh, there seems to be um, a bigger number of the member parliaments, particularly from the uh, European side, that are on the side of Ukraine. And um, without paraphrasing what uh, the speaker has spoken to about um, warmongering, that there is uh, this perspective that the war must continue, that there's a lot of resources that are being poured into Ukraine to ensure that there is a continuation of, um, of this war. Now talk to us about if we look at everything within that context and we locate this uh, proposal, South Africa's proposal around the transformation of, of, of the UN and, and the Security Council, do you think that um, it would be something that would gain support, uh, the overwhelming support of the member parliaments, given the current dynamics um, of, of, of the discussions around if we use that as a backdrop, if we use the uh, Russia-Ukraine uh, uh, conversation and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, articulations that we've seen um, on all platforms of the IPU, do you think that um, we may face, South Africa may face uh, similar challenges when it comes to ensuring that um, Africa, because in the main, it is about ensuring that Africa um, also is, has um, representation on the Security Council to ensure that you know we have an equitable uh, 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 you know participation from all parts of the world on the Security Council. Look, the the issue of uh, the reform of the United Nations is like slightly different from the discourse around uh, Ukraine and, and Russia. There are so many regions, actually a, a bigger number of regions that are excluded from meaningful participation Indeed. in the United Nations. And that includes the entirety of Southern America, it includes the entirety of the Caribbean islands, the entire African continent, a bigger component of Asia. Only Asian country, which is meaningfully represented is China. And yes. there's, there's, there's millions of people in the Asia region. I mean, India has got 1.2 billion people. Mm -hmm. Indonesia has got the fifth largest population in the world, but they don't have any meaningful say in the multilateral bodies. So that, that is a different discourse. And we believe that once this issue is introduced, it will gain the support of majority of countries, uh, including 
China and Russia. I'm not sure about uh, the other member, permanent members of the Security Council, if they will support right. this. But the the, the, the the a lot of countries will support them. Um, the situation in terms of what happened. And then of course, there is some irrational and uh, crazy obsession on how to characterize the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Yes. The Western powers led by Britain and the United States are basically pushing for an agenda that is narrowly and uh, without any reason just wants to condemn uh, Russia and do not want to speak much more clearly as to what are the circumstances that led to the war. Because Absolutely. the concern of Russia about NATO's expansion towards uh, the East is a legitimate concern. NATO is known for so many war crimes. Today, when we made an, an, an intervention in the plenary, we made it, uh, we reminded plenary and the IPU that NATO is responsible for the destruction of Libya and of assassination of uh, Colonel uh, Mama Gaddafi. In a senseless way, they went to destroy a country, to loot its natural resources, kill a head of state. They did the same thing in Iraq senselessly mm. on the pretext that there is uh, weapons of mass destruction. Mm. So you cannot trust NATO whenever it goes to uh, closer to countries that uh, the Western forces do not have control over. So they, 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 these legitimate concerns from the Russian Federation in terms of the expansionist policies and practices of NATO. And to just ignore that and say, let us condemn Russia, let us just demonize Russia all the times without looking into the intricacies of the conflict is problematic. But also it appears now from the report that is generated by the task force of the IPU that Ukraine parliament is not willing to engage with mm. the Duma, which is the Russian parliament. They are not willing to have dialogue or to end the conflict. What they are looking for is more supply of armaments and guns mm. to fight against Russia. They are not willing for any dialogue. And that is problematic. And if, if anything, what we can do uh, as the IPU, as members of parliament, as members of the global community, is to pressurize Ukraine and its leadership into a negotiation table because it looks like they are being utilized as a proxy by Western mm. forces that that believe that uh, uh, for, for some reason or in the foreseeable future, they will give Ukraine enough arms to defeat Russia, which is not possible. And, not and, possible. and, and if we're not careful about this thing, it, it's bothering also on a far much larger scale conflict, which can be avoided if Ukraine were to go to the negotiation table, mm. uh, facilitated by the IPU, by the United Nations, or other credible multilateral institutions. Indeed. Now, um, um, when we just talk a little bit more about the Russia-Ukraine situation, and uh, given uh, the current dynamics and um, this focus on demonizing Russia, so to speak, as you've uh, um, already articulated, what mechanisms is the South African uh, delegation using to engage more influential member parliaments that will be able to be used or utilized more effectively in terms of diffusing the situation instead of just having a conversation in the general assembly um, what other mechanisms uh, are being used to engage those probably are can be viewed as um, more influential in the discussion and in diffusing because obviously those member parliaments as well they bring the agenda of their of NATO as well they carry uh, the NATO agenda so to speak or the mandate um, so to speak so what mechanisms are being put in place uh, to ensure that there's consensus building around this perspective of engaging, making sure that the two countries both come to the table uh, and particularly influencing the Ukraine's position about coming to the table and diffusing the situation. Look, the only way is engagement now is to persuade each other that uh, let us persuade all the partners in the war, the people who are involved, the structures and countries that are involved in the war to go to the negotiation table to negotiate as to 
what becomes the ultimate solution. And, and the solutions are quite obvious that one, mm. NATO must stop its further expansion eastward uh, because it's a war alliance which uh, threatens the security of many countries which engages in senseless wars. So that, that can only be resolved through dialogue. And the mechanism that we had put in place mm. in the 144th uh, Assembly was a sensible and a better approach, wherein we said we are establishing a task force which South Africa is part of to then start dialogue with all the parliaments that are the, 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 the Ukrainian and Russian parliament. Mm. And, and, and I, I think that if anything, we this 145th assembly must reinforce that resolution and extend the time period of the task force to further engage with both parliaments uh, with the hope that there will be something much more meaningful when we go forward. But there, there is, of course, a lot of war mongering that is existing mm -hmm. Across uh, the board, uh, particularly from Western nations, they, they, yeah. they, are, they, are, they are being for blood. They do not want to talk, they just want to condemn and they just yeah. want to pride themselves that they are supplying guns to Ukraine. And that approach must be changed. There is no other way to put down a war situation or to end war except through dialogue. And that is what we can uh, do, and, and then we're able to then take it forward. I think that is basically how, how we handle it. Wonderful. Um, Honorable Shivambu, thank you very much for making the time to be with us this afternoon and for giving us that broad perspective on the work, uh, the meetings that you've attended, um, the governing council, and also the perspectives that were shared uh, by yourself as part of the delegation in the General Assembly earlier today. Um, okay. Viewers at home, uh, that was Honorable Shivambu giving us his broad overview um, and based on his participation and the key perspectives, um, also just speaking to South Africa's um, approach in terms of peacekeeping, the approach of ensuring that there's more dialogue uh, between the two countries. But of course, this will not be achieved without engaging all of the influential uh, partners, uh, both obviously in, in the Western within the Western nations. And we are talking about, um, of course, the, the member parliaments. And these member parliaments have got such an important role to play from an oversight perspective. And other uh, views that were also raised by Honorable Shibambu is the fact that um, there is a need to reform the United Nations, particularly the Security Council, because of the fact that it's not representative. Um, it has actually not changed composition um, since its inception, since it was established, the Security Council that is. And um, there is going to be more engagement with all of, within, of course, within the um, interparliamentary union uh, platform, but also broadly speaking, there's also a need to ensure that there is engagement with, um, within the static region, as well as the Africa region and all other countries that are not represented on the UN Security Council. With that said, um, I am now joined by Honorable Annalie Lotrit, who is also part of um, the delegation, the high level delegation that is in attendance of the 145th Interparliamentary Union Assembly currently taking place in Kigali, Rwanda. Um, Honorable Lotrit, I want to take this opportunity to welcome you to this platform and thank you very much for making the time to be with us this afternoon. Thank you very much, my pleasure. Wonderful. And let's just quickly um, talk about the two meetings that you've attended. You've attended uh, the meeting for women parliamentarians. You've also attended the meeting of the Standing Committee on uh, Sustainable Development. Uh, talk to us quickly about, firstly, the maybe let's start with the, the Standing Committee on Sustainable Development. What were the key um, agenda items for discussion in that committee? Well, uh, the Standing Committee, um, on sustainable development will have two themes, two topics that they will be discussing. Well, the one was dealt with yesterday and the other one will be uh, discussed tomorrow. Now, the first one that we looked at yesterday was the whole issue of carbon emissions and how to reduce carbon emissions the best we can. Now, it, the focus was for this particular session on uh, deforestation and uh, reforestation and the role of forests in this uh, halting of our carbon emissions. Yes. So from our perspective, we looked at 
um, South Africa and the kind of ecosystem that we have in South Africa and what we are doing um, in terms of forestation. And what we try to convey as well to uh, the delegates there, there were also specialists in attendance uh, via Zoom, is that South Africa is uh, to a reasonable extent quite forest rich. And therefore we have to place a lot of emphasis on our forestation and do everything in our power to prevent deforestation and rather focus on reforestation. And I think in our country, we have started doing this by projects where we are looking, for example, in the Department of Forestry um, to look at ways that we can uh, increase our forests, but at the same time also making it an economically viable option for people. Because we also have to mm. remember that within our country, um, there are many people who make a living from our forests, indigenous people. Mm. Our um, indigenous people have a vast knowledge of indigenous knowledge, and that is all tied to our forests. And that is something that we should preserve and enhance. And we also looked at the, the dangers that we are facing in our country, not necessarily of our own making. For example, uh, if you look at pests and diseases coming across our borders, which attack our forests, those are things that we will have to pay attention to and make sure that it doesn't happen because the devastation that can be wreaked on one forest, uh, different plantations, for example, where you have one pest multiplying and destroying a whole plantation. So um, we have to look after and care for our forests. What was interesting also that I found was the comment made by one of the experts, um, if I remember correctly, uh, Professor Books. And he said, what we must not do is the term afforestation. In other words, mm -hmm. that is where you're going to start a forest it's not deforest or reforestation, it is afforestation. So you're going to start forests in places where the actual local uh, ecosystem is not suitable. So it is a waste. You're destroying the one ecosystem. Now, by thinking you're doing a good thing by planting forests uh, to uh, prevent carbon emissions or to, to uh, absorb the, the carbon emissions, but in fact, it's counterproductive. So I think all those mm. things we have to take into consideration. And I think what was for me quite poignant and, and um, very close to South Africa is if you look at what has happened now in the Northern Cape with all the felt fires um, mm. and the forest fires we have, the ones we had in Naisna, that is devastating mm. because this That's is not only a, a biodiversity issue, uh, an eco issue, it is also an economic issue. So I, I'm very glad that we had this opportunity to discuss this. And I really hope that the resolution that we will be looking at will um, place emphasis on this and that this will be carried forward to COP27 uh, starting next month. Wonderful. I want to talk a little bit more, a uh, little bit about the carbon emissions. There's also a view, uh, viewed by a number of academics that, uh, there is no number of um, trees. Uh, obviously, that if we go in the forestation route, that will effectively address the issue of, of, of carbon emissions. So this is it's one component, it's one subcomponent uh, or mechanism that is being used to address the issue of carbon emissions. What other mechanisms um, are being used or are being put forth or postulated as um, you know, solutions, long-term, long-lasting solutions to address the issue of carbon emissions? I think the, the most obvious one is um, our use of, of fossil fuel. Um, we use fossil fuel for energy, and that has yes. high carbon emissions. So um, if we look at our fuel consumption um, in terms of our transport systems. Yeah. Now, I know that already we have carbon taxes across the world uh, trying to limit to get um, vehicles that emit less or less carbon, um, but you know, those are long-term solutions also, and it's not always possible to apply them. I think just now looking at what is happening in the world in terms of energy and the crisis we have because of the uh, war in Ukraine, 
um, all of a sudden people are going back to coal and fossil fuels for energy. Mm -hmm. um, so that is the, the reality that we sit with. So I think it's a very mm -hmm. complex issue. There are no quick solutions to this. Uh, we will have to look at ways to adapt to the changes that we are seeing. Um, if we look at what happened now in Pakistan, in different parts of the world with the floods, it's all interconnected with this um, in terms of climate change. Uh, but I think the important thing is that we are aware of it and that we look at ways that we can try and lessen the impact of climate change, including the common emissions that we have. Mm. Okay, so so when we uh, look at everything that is happening globally, and also how South Africa is obviously impacted as well, um, do we have the appropriate legislative framework in place to address as a country um, to respond effectively? As part of the commitments that we are making, of course, we're here representing the SA Parliament, um, and there's a lot of commitments that are made um, on this platform. Do we have the appropriate um, legislative framework and what mechanisms are being put in place then um, will be put in place to ensure that we do the necessary amendments so that we can be able to ensure that we implement whatever is necessary from a legislative perspective firstly and then of course then government needs to follow suit as well. Yes I think that that's a very interesting question because um, I believe that we, we will have to have a proper look at what the legislation is that we have at present in South Africa in terms of this. And not only in terms of where we have at this uh, particular point, uh, environmental laws, we have mining laws, we have energy laws. We will have to stop working in silos because they are all interconnected. So I think the way forward for South Africa is to have a more focused, inclusive approach to determine how these different departments impact on our climate and on our future. So I think uh, my reading of the legislation that we have at the moment is very, very specific in terms of a department. You, will, you have, mm. for example, legislation regarding forestry, you have legislation regarding the environment, you have like, legislation regarding um, mining operations and then energy provision, production mm. and provision. So those have to be married in some way because they all have an impact on our future and the way in which we live. So I think that is the first thing that we must do is to go and have a look at what we have. Is it sufficient? And I think this must be done after COP27 to see what kind of resolutions will be taken there and that we then get our legislation to talk to those resolutions. Absolutely. So a more integrated approach um, when it comes to addressing this matter, but also guided by COP27, the commitments made at COP27. Dr. Lottery, thank you so much uh, for making the time to be with us this afternoon and for sharing those insights. And of course, there is so much happening around the issue of climate change, and there's a lot of concern about what parliaments and governments should be doing to be more responsible that we can be able to safeguard this uh, planet that we're living in. With that said, thank you very much. Um, I want to just also say that that was um, Dr. Anneli Lottery giving us a broad overview of the platforms in which she participated. She, of course, participated in a standing committee of, on sustainable development where the issue of climate change and related matters was, was discussed. And one of the key issues that she was zoning in on was, of course, the issue of, um, of carbon, reducing carbon emissions and the role of parliaments, the parliaments of all of the global community to ensure that they respond more effectively um, to this uh, process, to a more global approach to reducing carbon emissions around the world. And of course, um, Parliament also, South Africa has got quite a number of pieces of legislation. Uh, the frameworks are in place, but they're sitting across various um, departments. And now she's saying that in relation to going forward, in terms of responding appropriately, it would be important to have a more integrated approach when it comes to um, ensuring that all the key departments that are sitting with key legislative um, instruments come together to ensure that um, the response to climate change is more integrated 
of course, also as guided by the commitments that are that we expect to come from COP27. I am now, of course, joined by uh, the Deputy Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, the Honorable Ms. Sylvia Lucas, who's also part of the high level delegation um, attending the 145th Interparliamentary Union Assembly. And um, she's, of course, joining us um, as the presiding officer, as the uh, uh, core convener of the IPU focus group in parliament and she's here to talk to us about the meetings that she's attended thus far. Honorable Lucas, thank you very much for making the time to be with us this afternoon and welcome to the platform. Good afternoon to you and also to the viewers, particularly our friends at home and thank you very much for taking us after such a tough two and a half days. Wonderful. Ma'am, you have uh, participated in quite a number of uh, platforms, but I particularly want uh, to focus on um, your attendance at yesterday's meeting where you attended the Human Rights and Democracy uh, Standing Committee, where South Africa made quite a number of uh, proposals with regards uh, to, 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 to the issue of human trafficking and the role of uh, not only our parliament, but the parliaments globally. Talk to us about uh, this resolution and what stands out um, to, to you, um, Honorable Lucas, when it comes to the key issues that you will perceive as having been uh, breakthroughs for, for the SA Parliament, that is. Thank you very much, uh, Sibulelo. As you know, there was one important resolution on the agenda of IPU that is with regards to the role of Parliament with regards to issues of high levels of international migration and also how do we put an end to human trafficking, even those that are state sponsored. Mm -hmm. Now this resolution was taken at the 144th uh, session of the assembly in Nusa Dua in Indonesia. And then now, it was distributed amongst member parliaments. I'm just trying to give a little bit of how the process, fine, uh, how we get here through the process. Yes, ma'am. All the member parliaments of IPU, and they've been requested to make inputs with regards to the resolutions, inputs of substance, but also inputs of correcting the, the grammar, correcting also the kind of, 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 of like uh, terms that is being used within the resolution. Mm -hmm. Now the Standing Committee on Democracy and Human Rights, I should say, it was not an easy task for us to be part and parcel of the discussion within that specific uh, Standing Committee. All of us know it's a very sensitive issue and also it's a very emotive issue because there was, I think it was from New Zealand, the fact that sometimes we speak about the killings of the deaths of the refugees or those that are victims, but we forget to speak about those that disappear without a trace. And that seems to be the more emotive issue that is bringing up a lot of emotions mm -hmm. in, within the families and also those that are next of kin of the specific victims of the specific area of illegal or irregular migration. Mm -hmm. The South African delegation actually proposed about 13 amendments to the, uh, to the, the resolution. And we've been strongly supported by Thailand, mm -hmm. by Syria, and by other countries Particularly, there was uh, some resolutions that we worked together with Thailand and Canada, and of which we actually fused our own resolutions because it was so close to one another. It's just that we were trying to, as an African delegation, to particularly put focus and emphasis on the issue of women and children and other vulnerable groups, Indeed. for example, people with disabilities. And we made sure that this is the issue that are being addressed. What we also try to address is to make sure that IPU take a principled stance with regards to issues 
around the globe of their member parliaments because it is so easy to get entangled in issues of specific regions, specific territories, forgetting that the issue of, uh, of human migration and also human trafficking, particularly migration, let me put it like that, is not always uh, existing within war torn or, uh, or, or territories where there is conflict. Absolutely. You also find that many people are displaced out of economic considerations. So we tried as the South African Parliament to actually expand our input to include all the areas that is actually contributing to not only human trafficking, but also migration. But like I said, we had a specific emphasis to make sure that the issues of gender-based violence, the issues of women, children, and other vulnerable groups are being included. And we really got a lot of support. I mean, there are many uh, parliaments that are coming here with proposals, but not a single proposal will, will sometimes be accepted. In the, in, in the case of South Africa, all our proposals have been accepted. Like I said, we if there is two or three, three in, in fact three, that we decided to say that, okay, ours are almost the same as the one of Thailand and Canada. Can we then merge the, the three? And we will be looking into the final resolution as to how they have merged our ideas with the ideas of other parliaments. But also there was another one where ourselves, Belgium and Canada were actually having more or less the same idea just with different words, because we are, we were convinced that governments and parliaments need to work closely with the non-governmental sector to make sure that those civil society organizations play a very important role, particularly in victim support, and also mm -hmm. to make sure that those uh, refugees that are, and particularly those that are victims of human trafficking, that there is a way that we deal with it. We actually proposed a clause and I think it was the only clause that was not fully supported but it was brought back by Canada and that was the clause that we uh, actually included to say there is this thing of migrants being sent back to the countries. As South Africa we are proposing that if you send refugees or migrants back do it in a, in a way that will respect their own human rights and also do it in a way that particularly for children from migrant children or displaced children, that there will be a kind of family structure within which they could be, uh, be brought back to. We also, like I said, we supported the issue of making sure that there is a principled approach from the mm -hmm. side of IPU, that you shouldn't say that, uh, say for instance, uh, as an example, George, is a, is a refugee receiving country, forgetting that S uh, Serbia for many years have been a refugee mm. receiving country. So mm. in any case, there is every territory have got their own challenges and they also have their own conflict internally and but also externally with their neighbors and so on. They have that you find that kind of conflict and it is very important that that kind of conflict, and that is what we emphasize in South Africa, should be addressed in a professional and a principled way, but also taking into account the human factor. So that is something that is very important. So I think South Africa has been, not only this time around, for the three, uh, is the fourth uh, IPU assembly that I'm attending, we've been able to to make a very constructive input within the, uh, the, the resolutions of, the, of, of the, 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 the IPU. And we really hope that in the final draft of the resolution, we will see our issues reflected. But fortunately, like I said, not even one of our issues was not adopted. The one that was not adopted was brought back by another country that agreed and it happened in 
in in in in, in Belgrade mm. that we wanted to withdraw, and that that time around it was on the issue of health care and health workers and the professionalization of the of the sector. And we thought that since we made so many inputs, we will withdraw that specific one. Australia, for instance, brought it back mm. at that stage. This time around, the one of the 13 that was not accepted or was not proposed by the rapporteur was actually brought back by Canada. So, and also other countries, for instance, mentioned that they feel that South Africa is making a very good contribution, particularly with the, uh, with the important, because this is, the main, one of the main uh, resolutions that is being debated here, besides the one on, 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 on parliaments and how do we build gender sensitive parliaments is the one on migration and human trafficking is one of the most important. It will even be discussed in the standing committee on peace and international security. So with the input that we have made, we believe that as South African, the role that we are playing at IPU is very constructive. Remember that our own speaker has been uh, selected to be part of the task force on Ukraine and Russia by the IPU. But also besides the, the Standing Committee on Democracy, we, are, we have also been uh, invited to a session of the World Health Organization yes. where we discussion on the issue of adolescent health. And also we have been requested by uh, this uh, subcommittee to work with them on a, on a country specific program that will deal with the issues of the well-being of our adolescents mm -hmm. within our country. So that is uh, some of the issues that we in the site meetings have, uh, have, be, have been addressing. Mm -hmm. And I think we are making an impact Without be uh, without really becoming part of the challenges or mm. of the problem, we are part of the challenges in trying to offer solutions, but we don't become part of the problems that you sometimes see because we feel that we've got objectively we've got a very very constructive role to play and we use that opportunity here at IPU. Absolutely. Deputy Chair, many of the discussions that are taking place on the IPU uh, platforms that are taking place against this backdrop of the Russia-Ukraine um, um, situation. How, what are some of the contentious issues that have, um, that came up uh, that uh, Deputy Chair may want to reflect on um, in terms of just having had to argue uh, for, you spoke about, um, you know, that there has to be uh, an unbiased um, approach in terms of dealing with, with issues, because all countries have got, uh, are dealing with the same issue, perhaps, but maybe from, in a, from a different perspective, maybe. So talk to us a little bit about uh, some of the contentious issues that may have come up and that will, will require a more uh, focused attention in terms from a preparatory perspective to ensure that by the time we get to the next IPU um, assembly, that there is a more uh, target targeted approach to ensure that those other member parliaments um, that require probably more engagement with them to get them on board in terms of the approach um, uh, in recognizing, of course, the IPU's role as the, if we're talking about um, uh, interparliamentary uh, diplomacy, parliamentary diplomacy and the role, which really um, it hinges on what the key objective of the IPU is about. So talk to us about some of the contentious issues and how will these issues be addressed um, in going forward and in preparation, particularly for the next um, IPU assembly. One thing that, that was disconcerting and of which we, we actually took a very strong stance in our committees was the fact that although there is a war between Russia and Ukraine, is that resolutions are not taken for a specific territory. Hmm. We need to take resolutions on the basis of principle. For instance, there was a resolution that we don't agree with, that we didn't agree with, because it was drafted in, the, uh, in mentioning specific the issues of refugees that are being displaced because of the Russia-Ukraine war. But the Middle East, uh, the countries from the Middle East found that there is a, an ongoing attack on the Palestine, for instance, and they have and they have mentioned many countries, Crimea, 
those other countries have been mentioned that are going through the same issues. And also there was a specific resolution or a part of the resolution on issues of refugee receiving countries, mentioning like three countries. And mm -hmm. immediately the, de the delegation from, uh, from the, the East or from the Middle East again, came up with around about eight countries that are still also in the same situation. But we also reported on Sub-Saharan Africa, where there mm. is not necessarily conflict, but there are so many people that are displaced. So what we want from IPU, and we were very emphasize, emphasizing it very strongly, is that we must take decisions or resolutions on a basis of principle. Absolutely. and not on the basis of our bias towards one or other situation. And that is one of the resolutions that we couldn't really agree with. And some of the res resolutions that are being proposed are unrealistic. For instance, there was a proposal that any refugee children must be able to access education in their own native language, in the receiving country in the host country and also that the host country must take responsibility to make sure that they uphold the culture of the refugees and we disagreed on that uh, score what we agreed with is the children must be must have access to health to education and also be safe that is what we thought the resolution could agree and fortunately even those that didn't agree with us eventually, we could convince them and they agreed with us because the reason why, and I think we need to motivate why we took that stance. If you look at some of the countries, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, many of the countries are very poor. So if this is going to become a, 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 a resolve here and countries have to provide for a native uh, language, and mother tongue education and so on, while some of them are even struggling to provide for their own citizens, how are they going to do it for refugee? And I still feel the issue of culture and heritage, the family has got an important role to play within that. And if you go to a, another country, the, 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 the funny part of it is that here there is about 10 languages that are being <clears throat> translated <clears throat> and then I started to speak Afrikaans and there was no provision for Africans you understand and that is why we said we must take uh, decisions that will work for all of us and not, not just for a few because in the end it doesn't then it doesn't help for African countries to be part of the IPU if we take decisions for developed nations and not nation net, uh, necessarily for the developing nations. It was but one or two controversial issues, but at least we could really maneuver our path through it because we also took the, 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 the kind of attitude that if you, people don't agree, they will be voting on that issues. And if we are outvoted, we have made our point. And that is the most important part because in the end, why do you attend multilateral uh, platforms? If you can't put your view, and if you differ, you can differ in a very constructive way without being, uh, without bringing about conflict. And I think, uh, I think this, the the issue of 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 war, and the stance of South Africa on making sure that there is consistent engagement to one another, because we must take the responsibility to ensure that no conflict escalates to the point where it won't be actually, it won't be able for the world to handle it. And as parliaments, we've got the responsibility to make sure that we advise our governments that we, how we want to see them dealing with conflict necessarily. Indeed. Deputy Chair, you've given us a very comprehensive um, overview on um, the inputs that were made by, by the South African delegation at the Human Rights and Democracy um, Standing Committee of the IPU. But now in going forward, um, talk to us about how um, 
the committee, issues that obviously that came up on the platform of the committee, we can see that the issue of Russia and, and Ukraine seems to be dominating uh, the discussions and it finds expression even in issues that are unrelated, where you'll find that there's, if there seems to be a concerted effort uh, to ensure that even all of the resolutions since this uh, conflict started between Russia and Ukraine, all of the resolutions, um, the countries that are advocating that stand with Ukraine, um, they want to make it about um, the situation between Russia and Ukraine. What other mechanisms um, from the platform of the Standing Committee on, on Human Rights and Democracy um, will be used um, as a preparatory mechanism to ensure there's more, uh, especially from a, a parliamentary diplomacy uh, perspective, to ensure that there's more engagement and preparation to make sure that that hostilities decline uh, from a debate perspective because now they're more emotive based on um, the hostilities between the two countries where we see that uh, there seems to be a polarization. There's one half, uh, a greater portion that stands with Russia. There's a greater portion also that stands with Ukraine. So what mechanisms are in place uh, on the basis of, of parliamentary diplomacy to engage in preparation for the next assembly as we conclude, ma'am? What we agreed in Nusador, in the Indonesia, Bali, was that there should be a task force, and I've already said our own speaker and the speaker of Namibia, and I, uh, I think the speaker of Zimbabwe is part of that uh, task force. First of all, the task force went to the war-torn countries, to Russia and to Ukraine. As we're engaging now, we have not yet received the feedback or the report from that task force. So in actual fact, I don't know, is it not maybe counterproductive mm. for us to be engaging in discussions around Ukraine and Russia whilst there is this task force that still, they, they must still bring their report to the assembly. Mm. So for this assembly, to already start a new process, a dual process mm -hmm. for the discussion of the Russian and Ukraine uh, situation. It's counterproductive, definitely, because we really don't know what is the current situation. And mm -hmm. the task force was like in, 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 in Jakarta, Indonesia, as early as the past weekend to sit down, to begin to discuss the issues and mm -hmm. to bring their recommendations. To the, uh, to the governing council, as well as to the, to the assembly. And as the assembly, we will possibly only receive the report more, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. And whilst we are, have not yet received the report, it is, or, it is as if some countries have already came to the conclusion that Absolutely. they are going to, to take the mm -hmm. one side. I mean, it is a fact that Russia has actually attacked Ukraine. But Russia has been consistently saying, let, if NATO can stay out of our, out of, uh, uh, of our domestic affairs, we will be able to address the story. But from the side of Ukraine, there is a lot of emotion that they are bringing up. But even the, 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 the delegation of Ukraine in our committee just brought the two emotive issues. And then, uh, I mean, the, it is, it is impossible for all of us just to decide that we are jumping on this bandwagon without knowing the other side of the story. But we also address the fact that some of the countries didn't even give Russia, the Russian delegation, a, a, an opportunity to, 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 to speak, just to speak or to contribute. They started to howl them. But we, we actually intervened and we said all of us are full paying members of this uh, uh, union and each of us deserve the same respect even if we don't agree with one another we could deal with that issue we could intervene and we could decisively deal with that issue and we have been respected by other countries for standing up for something that is really not assisting in terms of the whole situation but all that we can say is that we really hope that the sooner this conflict between russia and ukraine can be brought to its logical conclusion, the better for us, so that we can actually continue doing the good work that IPU stand for. And unfortunately, because of sometimes 
not being objective. Some of us are being caught in the middle of this conflict situation. So we hope that sanity will prevail because we need to take sane and principled decisions as a body that need to coexist as parliamentarians or as parliaments beyond the conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And if this is not coming to a conclusion very soon, we, we are afraid if things might escalate, it is not serving the interests of the world. It is not serving the globe and it is not serving the struggling countries that is already currently struggling because of the conflict between Ukraine and Russia. Thank you. Deputy Chair, you've given us a very comprehensive overview of the discussions that took place in yesterday's um, Human Rights and Democracy um, Standing Committee. Um, and I want to thank you very much for making the time to be with us this afternoon to report back, not only to our viewers, um, um, those who are logging in from anywhere around the world, but particularly uh, the South African constituency that is obviously also following the proceedings. So thank you very much for making the time to be with us. That was of course the Deputy Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, the Honorable Ms. Sylvia Lucas, who was just talking talking to us about the discussions that took place at uh, the Standing Committee uh, on Human Rights and Democracy. And it was really just about ensuring that all of the perspectives, um, particularly South Africa's perspective around um, ensuring that there's peaceful, that there is a peaceful uh, uh, resolution to the conflict in, in Russia and Ukraine, that this platform of the resolution also provided space uh, to engage and to bring in that peacekeeping component um, to addressing the issues, uh, the backdrop, which obviously is the backdrop currently um, dominating the discussions of the IPU. With that said, we are going to stop there for now. Uh, we will bring you more insights uh, from our members as they continue uh, to attend the various platforms of the IPU. With that said, uh, thank you for staying with us, but do stay tuned. Thank you.